Have you heard the phrase, sitting is the new smoking? In this episode, I want to let you know about a new product I've put together called Crushing Office Syndrome that deals with the effects of the sedentary lifestyle. It's an online Qigong training product, and I created it for the many professional people I know who spend six to eight hours a day at a desk and suffer from backache, neck ache, and stress generally. This product has over 15 Qigong exercises, multiple follow-along routines, and supporting PDFs to help you along. And it leaves you feeling more flexible, more mobile, and mentally fresh. You can find a link to the product in the podcast description or visit warriorstrategy.com slash products. Again, you can find a link to the product in the podcast description or just visit warriorstrategy.com slash products. Thanks. Hello there, this is Robin Gamble. Welcome to the Scholar Warrior podcast. Now the idea of the Scholar Warrior has been around for thousands of years across many great cultures. And the concept is this, that one of the highest achievements in society is to become skilled in the martial arts while also pursuing the scholarly pursuits of painting, poetry, music, philosophy and more. So it's here that I interview martial artists as well as artists in various fields so that you, the listener, can gain a peek into their techniques, skills and strategies for success. And so that you, the listener, may gather these gems and apply them on your own path to self-mastery and excellence. Enjoy. My guest today is Dr. Ying Ying Liu. Dr. Ying Ying Liu was born and raised in China and later received her master's and doctorate degrees in the USA. She then taught in the US at the university level for six years. Her focus now is supporting organizations, executive teams, and individuals in successfully achieving their global business objectives. She has worked with more than 90 multinational companies, many of which are Fortune 500 companies, and her clients have included Chinese and Western executives, including top-level regional and country heads, CEOs, and SVPs. Suffice to say, she has a deep understanding of international business process systems and structures. Dr. Yingying is fluent, obviously, in both English and Chinese, so expertise uh, often involves uh, riding the gap between those two cultures. And did I forget to mention that she's also a classically trained concert pianist and vocalist who's performed solos to a concert audiences? Yeah, okay. Needless to say, Dr. Ying is a cultural and linguistic and musical and leadership scholar, and on a personal note, I've worked with her on several occasions and have been struck by her cool, calm, and professional demeanor. It's always an absolute pleasure to chat and share ideas with her. And with that, I welcome Dr. Ying Ying Liu to the Scholar Warrior podcast. Welcome. Hi, thank you, Robin. It's (laughs) wonderful to hear your voice and uh, being here with you on this again. Great. Okay. So... I would love to um, jump into uh, your, your, the backstory a little bit because um, obviously you were born and raised in China. I spent some time in China over, over a year and lived there and found it to be fascinating. And um, so perhaps we could just chat a little bit about what it was like um, growing up in China day to day. I mean, uh, just for the benefit of our listeners who maybe never been to Asia, maybe never been to China. Um, what was that like growing up there? Oh, yeah, that's a very good question, Robin. Uh, when I was growing up in the 60s in China, it's a different world then, right? Right. Uh, so I was born in 1963. By 1966, we had the Cultural Revolution. So when everything basically was turned upside down in China, so... When I was growing up, uh, you know, anything that is related to culture, it's supposed to be bad. So even traditional culture or specifically Western culture, all very viewed as, as just... 
sort of enemy, bad elements. Enemies, yes. enemies of the mind. Enemies of the, of the <laughs> mind. That's a, that's a good good <laughs> good description. So um, we were, you know, when I was about six years old, we were all the whole family were exiled to the countryside because my father um, and my mother, my parents were intellectuals. Right. And so they were so-called the capitalist road runners at that time. Right. And so we were all exiled to the countryside and to basically supposed to become peasant farmers and to learn from peasant farmers so that uh, we'll be re-educated. So I was six years old and we were in the countryside. So I grew up actually partially in the countryside uh, in the, in China. Okay. And uh, we were there up, uh, around nine years or so. Uh, however, you know, my, my parents being the artists they were, they are, they were, mm. that they, they never forget uh, to uh, wanting to educate their children you know, mm. with music. So as soon as uh, the rules are loosened a little bit and they were giving me uh, piano lessons, Right. So as a child, uh, but it was it was difficult situation because you know the the piano was confiscated as everything else that's just culture. So our records, our books, our our piano were all uh, taken away, and mm. eventually, uh, I guess they didn't want it anymore. So we slowly, after a few years, we asked for, you know, to get them back. Wow. So we we got some back in the countryside which is a very interesting kind of situation because you know so we have this little mud house mm. <laughs> the mud house and then uh the the bed basically is also made of mud bricks so that you put the you know how you, you've been to northeast china yes so we were in shenyang uh near shenyang and panji and so at in the in the northeast china all the beds were sort of made of mud bricks. So they piled them up and wow. they, they put together. So half of the room is, is this bed. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's mud house. And so it often leaked. Right. So when I was, gr you know, growing up often, you know, when outside is raining, inside is dripping, right? Yeah. Because the roof is also made of uh, straws with mud on it. Right. Uh, so that it often leaked. So, uh, and the floor is often completely like, uh, like mud. It's, because right. it's it, like pounded dirt. Is that correct? Yes, right. exactly. Mm. Pounded dirt. And so, so we have to put the piano on the bed, so called. The, oh. the kang. In wow. <laughs> so when I was a child, I used to play um, on the, you know, brick bed. Uh, so on the kang. And then, uh, uh, it's very hard to get a lessons uh, because, uh, you know, the city is far away. And uh, at that time, there's not much uh, transportation from the countryside, from the village. Mm -hmm. So my mother was first uh, my, my piano teacher. But and then later on, we found another artist. Many artists were exiled to the country during that time. So then I had to basically walk with my parents walk about 60 kilometers or so to another village to just get one piano lesson. Whoa, okay. Yeah. This is, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, we've had conversations before which you alluded to the conditions that you grew up in, but this is, uh, this is something else. So six, <laughs> 60 kilometers to walk to get a piano lesson. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's... It's uh, pretty far away, and uh, and uh, usually we sl we stay there for a couple of days uh, at the teacher's home, right. uh, because she used to work for my father in one of the sauna dance troops uh, in uh, Liaoning Province. So, so you know they were good friends. So that's how I started my 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 you know early life as a you know s s student of classical music so, and we will listen to we will listen to wonderful wonderful at night mm -hmm. uh when everybody else 
had gone to sleep, my father would break out this old Czech uh, record player with the old Russian radio, and uh, we would listen to some of the records uh, that were returned to us. This this was a few years later. In the beginning, we didn't even have electricity. Right. But a few years later, uh, we were able to have that. And so we would listen to this wonderful classical music. And not only classical music, but when I was growing up, my, my father had a collection of all kinds of records from all over the world, including, you know, Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms, Debussy, uh, Bize, but also, you know, uh, Smetana from Eastern Europe and Tchaikovsky, you know, uh, Bartok, uh, and including all the folk, folk music. He especially loved folk music. So I listened to a lot of, you know, Romanian folk music, uh, uh, Hungarian folk music, wow. Cuban folk music, Peruvian. So they're, they're quite amazing. Um, collection of yeah. these wonderful sounds. Can so, you imagine? No, that's, what, that's exactly <laughs> the question. The, exactly the question that sprung to mind was, what must it have felt like to, to have been living in those conditions and had access to kind of that music? So, so if you were sitting there listening to that music, what, what were you kind of experiencing? It is fantastic because your mind, it, your imagination really takes you so far into time and space and location to totally a different culture. You know, music is such a wonderful expression of culture, right? Yeah. And folk music, whether if it's Indian folk music or Peruvian or, or, or Romanian, so your mind as a child, you're, I, I was very fortunate, I think, as a child to have a, you know, parents that, that was so, in a way, very worldly. Mm. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, my father had, you know, when he was young, he went to Europe, traveled in Europe a, a bit. So, uh, and my mother also. My mother speaks uh, uh, another language. My mother speaks Japanese, mm. who is also very much uh, into, you know, dance. She was a choreographer and dance, and also into painting. So they also have a lot of collections of uh, books and also uh, just albums of wonderful painters from Europe. For instance, you know, I remember seeing all the images of uh, Rembrandt, mm. uh, Degas, uh, uh, Renoir, uh, you know, Monet, all of these uh, different uh, images and uh, paintings. I mean, it's just incredible. I think think to grow up and it's such a contrast right yes. in the countryside you barely have enough to eat sometimes mm. we didn't have enough to eat so we have to then go get uh, some these uh, dandelion leaves mm. and mixed with some of the uh, uh, beans or, or potatoes or or you know sometimes at two months you have nothing but potatoes to eat yeah. uh, if you have enough uh, sometimes you don't and uh, so, uh, it, this is yeah. It's absolutely uh, it's an incredible story. <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. And when I when I think about the the artists that you mentioned, I mean, if uh, I mean today, I would say if 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 a little English kid was growing up with access to that to that music and that art, of course it's there. But if if you go looking, but if the parent is actually setting up the um, the opportunities to be exposed to that art. Then that's a lucky that's a lucky situation for for that kid. But then, given yeah. the environment that you were in, mm -hmm. to, to to be exposed to that to that level of art is just something else altogether. And also, to, I mean, from the description of your parents, they, uh, of course, this is a, a absolutely. Uh, a, I mean, it's a tragic situation to to be in. But as far as the description of of their jobs, they would have been public enemy number one. Um, yes. So and many. Oh. They, Absolutely. Many people Absolutely. like that would have, were, were persecuted even, uh, even uh, in more extreme measures from what I understand. I, I don't know if that's true or not. Well, you are absolutely right, Robin, because uh, I have not told you to some of the darker side of what they have gone through. Right. For instance, before we were settling into the countryside, my father was 
uh, routinely taken away and beaten uh. during the Cultural Revolution. And one time he was beaten with belts, thick belts with nails on them. God. And so that his back was so badly, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to s describe it. It took him about a month to, to, to recover My uh, his back. Uh, and there were times that he could not sleep on his back. He has to sleep on his front, right? Right. And he was, you know, they shaved his head. Uh, he had to bend in 90 degrees. I mean, those are all very Tor torture. routine. Yeah, the routine, you know, and withstand many these called struggle meetings during the Cultural Revolution. And he is not alone. Some of his friends couldn't take the heat. And I, I know several of them commit suicide because oh. of... Uh, they just couldn't take the the humiliation and all that physical abuse. So uh, so he's gone through a lot, and uh, so is my mother uh, because my my grandfather from my mother's side went to Taiwan for business in 1948, mm -hmm. and so you know, and he he then you know 1948 when the transportation got cut off between mainland and China. Mm. He basically stuck there for the rest of his life. So right. he then, uh, during the Cultural Revolution, before the Cultural Revolution, he was sending, you know, hearing aids to my grandmother. My grandmother has, you know, hearing problems. Mm. But during the Cultural Revolution, some of the, some of the ignorant uh, people thinking that was, uh, that was some kind of a device for her to listen to enemy stations, you know. Okay. So, so yeah. you know, uh, my my home uh, when I was young was looted um, a few times uh, mm. when you know the red guards coming in and and uh, just destroyed everything and torn the books and smashed some of the records and taken whatever they think it's the for all the, all the tr cultural relics and get it either smashed or taken away. So a lot of wonderful cultural things were destroyed, right? Mm, yeah. Um, uh, I think um, I think it's very, very useful to know about the realities of, of what happened. And also I think this helps us get a little bit of perspective of life today as well. And obviously there are a lot of problems in, in Western society, but... <laughs> this gives you a little bit of perspective, I think, you know, as, yes. to, as to how lucky anyone is just to live in a free society where you can have different ideas and, mm -hmm. not, and not be uh, massively persecuted for them. Exactly. So China has come a long ways, yes. right? Come Absolutely. a long ways. So, uh, I mean, you know, today's life in China is vastly better and so much uh, different from that time in the 60s. I can remember, so, my, sorry, I can, I can remember uh, when I was living there, my Tai Chi teacher who, who was, I guess, in his mid-60s around about that time, saying, mm -hmm. saying yeah, the, peop the young people today just don't understand what we went through. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, they just have no idea. They're living in a, yeah. totally, different, a totally different China. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, one thing I do, you know, when you were saying, oh, wow, you know, what kind of culture environment that you actually grew up with, it's a, such a dichotomy of a contrast, right? On the one hand, it's incredibly bleak, mm. the physical world in that time and the political, social world. But on the other hand, within the family and the circles of the family in the countryside, uh, there's a uh, because of my parents and their their friends are all artists. There's such a rich culture uh, environment in how I grew up. And just to give you one more threat in that is that you know so the kind of music, the kind of uh, images, uh, you know, uh, as in visual arts that I have been exposed when I was a young child. Another threat is the kind of literature. Just to give you an idea, you know, my parents are constantly reading at night when after a day's hard work as a peasant farmer, okay. but they always read. So I got into the habit of reading classic uh, literature with them. So whatever they were reading, I was reading too. Right. So to give you an idea of what I was reading as a child is that uh, I read all the Greek tragedies wow. and 
the French comedies and uh, all the when I uh, I think before I was 14 I read most of the Shakespeare uh, plays uh, translated into Chinese of course mm. and a lot of the uh, Balzac uh, novels uh, the uh, 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 Tolstoy you know a yeah. lot of the Russian Pushkin and also a lot of the Western uh, novels and uh, Dante uh, 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 Old Man and the Sea uh, uh, Don Quixote uh, I, I mean there are many wonderful uh, black uh, uh, red and black uh, so you have I mean, just tremendous, tremendous uh, literature it's, that I it, read. It's unbelievable. The, the, before I was a teenager. The irony is you probably have a better, you, you had a better education there than many people get in very expensive schools that, you know, that, that don't look yes. at all the, the arts, the, you know, the, the classics that you just mentioned. Yes. It's an extreme, extreme environment. It is. I mean, if I... When we see, when I see you next time, mm. uh, I'd love to show you this one uh, Peruvian singer that I used to hear in the countryside. With that with the contracts of of that background, it's just it's another worldly. It's unbelievable. Mm. So, 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 so obviously, music became a factor. How, how did that? So, you eventually got to the U.S. to study music. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, when I was 22, uh, you know, I applied for quite a few uh, U.S. schools. At that time, I, you know, because my father been to the West and I was growing up with all this background and trained as a, uh, a pianist, basically, in China. And I wanted to go to the West. I also wanted to see the world, right? Because in my head, in my mind, I have all these different fascinating images and stories and, and ideas about what the West is like. And, and um, so I, I then applied for schools and I was, you know, awarded a scholarship to go to the U.S. music school. And uh, so I went and I studied music. I studied music um, uh, my master's, my doctorate, all in piano performance and literature. So this is an important transition for me, I have to say, because, you know, going to the West for the first time as a Chinese girl, um, uh, it's a different world than I have imagined. Yeah. And uh, um, actually, all of these um, backgrounds that I have um I, I still need to continue to hone in on the actual skills and understand the structures and the cultural background in a more systematic way. Mm -hmm. So I did that in the studies, right? Mm -hmm. So I studied Western uh, music, and but mostly the cultural background that generated that music. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, what had happened in the music history from Western music history from, you know, 850 uh, all the way to 20th century, right. right? From Gregorian chant and then through the, 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 the Renaissance and, and the Baroque period, what kind of cultural background had enabled those kind of music to grow at the time and what happened in the Enlightenment? And so the the, the Mozart and, and later on the Romantic period, um, and all the changes and to later on Industrial Revolution and, and 20th century, all the, all, all the background in terms of culture happening that, that produces all this wonderful, incredible music and music, musicians, of course, thoughts and at the time. So that's a really wonderful opportunity for someone like me. And that really get exposed to the thoughts uh, and the culture of Western music development. Yeah. And of course, at the same time, I had to, you know, really hone in and, and, and uh, really advance my technical skills in terms of performance. Right. So, and, and that was, 
what um, really um, I think kept me pretty focused for quite quite some years. So I I would guess that that focus would also kind of guide you through any culture shock that you might have had, or what, did did you feel discombobulated at all between the the, the difference of culture, or was it was it an easy <laughs> easy path? Yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a very very good question. Uh, yes and no. Okay. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> yes, of course, I went through culture shock. Be- uh, however, it was very exciting, right? Mm. Because you are in a different culture, and so as a young person, you're very open-minded to the different culture. That doesn't mean that I wasn't in culture shock. It doesn't mean that I didn't. Uh, go through some difficulties because people are American culture really it was very different from Chinese culture in many ways however also in some ways are very similar uh, the difficulty is that for instance um, at school I think uh, in China at school you're expected to be listening mainly and to be really taking in all the wisdom and everything that the teacher would pass on to you, right? Yeah. That's yeah. the idea. You listen, you study, and you do what the teacher tells you to Lao, do. Lao sure knows best. That's right. <laughs> and as you can tell, with my character, <clears throat> it wasn't the best fit, actually, for me because... <laughs> I, I've always, growing up, like, uh, you know, with the earlier background I told you, my parents was not the kind of traditional thinkers as Chinese culture. That they're, they're really quite open-minded. Um, so I was somewhat rebellious in the Chinese school. But when I went to the U.S. school, it was a different requirement to be a good student. You, you're required to participate. Yeah. You're required to contribute. And so that I have to go from the other mode of studying, being a good student to be a different kind of student. Mm. Right. So I learned how to um, <clears throat> how to contribute, how to participate and how to articulate uh, your ideas. Uh, but English as a second language. First, it's very, very difficult. So you basically, in class, even though you're asked to participate, but you have to translate what you hear back into Chinese mm, right. and then translate your thoughts back into English again mm. before you are actually be able to articulate your thoughts. So you're basically three or four steps behind in, uh, those Natives, you know, yeah. classmates that are English as a first language. So you're always slow. Once you formulated your idea, uh, the discussion had already gone to, you know, three or four steps ahead of you. And so you have to really learn f- quickly um, to how to do that. I still remember, actually, I kept a notebook from the first year and the first couple of classes when I went to a literature class, I literally came back and spent four hours on just a few pages of the reading mm. and take, you know, painstakingly take out all the words I didn't know and writing them down and get the dictionary and understand what it means in Chinese and translate it into Chinese. And I remember just a few pages took me four hours wow. and I kept that notebook but for, so one, from that point until about I was able to somewhat freely to participate in class and to contribute, uh, it took me one and a half years, I think. Well, still, that still sounds pretty quick to me. <laughs> That's phenomenal. Yeah. So you've got these, you've well, got these but, two filters yeah. that you've got to go through before you yes. can get an answer out. Yes, you do. That's basically it. So the, the yes, there's culture shock. Uh, um, you know, to, to to just have a different ways of thinking about what being part of a group really is about, right? Mm, yeah. So when, uh, this is just, a, uh, I don't know, out of my personal interest, do you think, do you think in, in, do you think in English? 
when you're speaking English and think in Chinese when you're speaking Chinese? Or yes, yeah. now I do. Right now I do, but it takes a little bit of switch. Uh, as you were, if you let's say uh, you're driving a car, you have to change gears, right? Yeah. You starting from second to the third or third to the fourth, and and changing languages sometimes you know it takes a, a quite a a bit of uh, switching gears, mm -hmm. so it takes a little bit, yeah. and when that particular language kicks through, so um, at first that gear changing is not very smooth, right? Yeah. yeah. So these days it's much more smooth, uh, smoother for me. For instance, I could probably. Do this, and then the next minute switching into Chinese and and thinking in that and talking that, but still you can tell the when you switch, there's still a little bit of uh, a time time factor in there. You're yeah. at initially you may not be as smooth. Yeah. Uh, but these days, since I am mostly working and living in the English environment, so actually speaking English is very very easy for me and thinking in English. I remember one night uh, years ago, I started dreaming in English. Then I know that I actually English is okay. It's definitely in uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but sometimes switching back to Chinese, mm -hmm. even though it's my first language, but it takes a little bit. Uh, so when I speak to my friends and uh, sometimes the first minute or so, it's a little clunky, but and then uh, it just comes back, like riding a bike. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> I, I'd love to dive into a little bit of the performance ac aspect, if you don't mind. And obviously, you were a, a high level, a high level musician as well. So maybe you could give people a little bit of insight as to what the preparation looks like before you would give, for example, a solo piece in concert or, the, mm -hmm. the, or some kind of performance. Yes. If, if you're, you're yeah. going to have to perform in front of people, what yes. would the preparation uh, look like? Mm, mm. Very good question. So um, as a performing classical performer, uh, the preparation really is uh, quite extensive, right? Mm. So... Uh, you spend basically months in learning the details of the piece, both of the structure of the piece. For instance, if you play a three-movement sonata, okay, so you then you learn the structure, each the the entire structure of the sonata, whether three or four movements, and then within each movement there is a structure. Either it's in sonata form, it could be in binary form, it could be in compound tenery form, it could be in roundel form, so on and so forth. Quite like the uh, like a symphony, four movement symphony or three movement symphony or a concerto. So that you you then learn, obviously, you need to learn the thousands of notes that to do with that. So you need to understand the structure. You need to understand the style. You need to understand the characters that the the uh, the music is trying to convey. Yeah? yeah. Then you need to understand the the composers that. that uh, the period that they live, what kind of mood, and how they wrote the music. So the first intentions of the first creation, because you're in the second creation process, you're interpreting. Okay. So you do a lot of that. Obviously, in the preparation, you need to listen to many, many different recordings of other people who had con come before you, the great masters of performers that had interpreted this music. So for instance, I get a piece of music, I learn all the notes, I learn all the background, the context of how the music came about, the composers and then the structures, the notes itself, the character, and then I go to the library, I listen to many different kind of performances for instance, it could be a piece of music could be performed by the great masters. It could be played by Rubinstein, Horowitz, uh, you know, Gisekin, uh, by uh, many different great performers in the past. And the reason for that is that you don't want to sort of, as a young person or as a, you know, 
a study a scholar of musician, you don't want to just rely on one source of sound. So what you do is you listen to many different uh, masters. I'm sure it's the same with Tai Chi, right? Yeah. Uh, you don't want to just go with one form uh, of a master. You want to know all the schools of thinking. So, so then you do that, and you then, after that, you don't really want to follow one because you want to be authentic of your own interpretation. Because if you are not authentic, you don't have something to say yourself in the performance of a particular piece of music. Why should anybody else listen to you? They right? can go and listen to a recording, right? Yeah, they can just listen to Rubinstein, mm -hmm. right? Why should they come to listen to a, uh, a you perform? You have to be authentic, unique in your performance, but at the same time, respect what the intentions of the composers are. So you need to listen to us, but also you need to go with the music itself. That means really study the score, mm -hmm. understand what the composer is trying to say and how they want to say it. Then you need to practice a lot. You need to practice. I mean, you know, as they say, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Right. So you need to go through a lot of uh, repetition because your mind and your body has to become one in mm -hmm. interpreting the music. Mm -hmm. So you spend hours of perfecting every single phrase, every single note, all the timbers and colors and the movement, how you're going to interact with the piano to get the ideal, ideal sound. Then you, so you prepare this for months and months right, really perfecting it, after that, you still have to go into the hall, you're actually going to perform, mm -hmm. and to work with the acoustic. Right. So even if you have perfected it with your, between yourself and a particular instrument, and you need to think about how to interpret the music, everything, you then need to really take into the acoustic of the hall into consideration, and the audience. Because after all that preparation, if you cannot really understand how the acoustic in the hall works, how the sound travels through your body interaction with the instrument, then you still don't, won't have, won't engage your audience. But before you actually go to the performance, you have to do even more than that. In the preparation, it's very critical that you do what we call mental practice. I'm sure it's the same with Tai Chi, yeah? Okay. So not only that you practice, so in the practice, you not only sit at the piano, play it and, and perfect it, but there are times practice also means stay away from the piano. In fact, even right. from the beginning, you just sit with the score and imagining how the sound to be in your mind and then lose the score, then imagining the whole performance in your mind, what we call mental practice is that you sit with your eyes closed without the score quietly, but you perform as if you are performing from beginning to the end of the entire piece in your mind. Yeah. If you can do that, you could probably do it on stage because when you are when you are on stage your heart is beating like a wild horse and your palms are sweating your hands shakes a little bit your legs shakes a little bit you're breathing also a little bit fast and you need to be able to really calm yourself and and you, hopefully your body, your kinesthetic memory won't fail you. Your mind still be able to be in control somewhat, even under that great pressure. One, 3,000 pairs of eyes on you with the very bright light shining on the whole stage. You walk out, you have one shot. You don't have a second chance. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. a lot of pressure. 
So you still have to perform. So how do you perform? The, the preparation is very important. So you prepare mentally. Not only that, one more step before you actually walk on stage is that you actually practice performance because you just practice, it's not enough. You have to practice performance. What does that mean? For classical performers, it means that usually if I have a serious uh, you know, public performance, what I do is two weeks before, I start practicing performing, meaning that I, you know, there are a couple of steps. One is I start run through the entire program because usually you perform, you don't perform one piece. You perform entire program, three or four pieces. Mm. And so I run through the entire recital program in one go <clears throat> as if in performance. That means I won't allow myself to stop and fix things, right? right? Yep. As in practice. So I just run it through and then I see where needs fixing. Then after I run through, I fix it. I imagine myself in a hall of whatever that hall is to be, 800 people or 3,000 people. Okay, so I have that imagined audience and I walk on stage, I sit down, I imagine that space, the situation, I perform the whole thing. So that's step number one. I do this a few times. Then I need to do as a performer is I get a couple other people, actual audience. So that that's the next step. When it gets closer to the recital, you actually do it every day, at least two or three times you run through the program. That means in the morning you get up, you already run through the program once yeah. without any preparation. And then at lunchtime, if you can, or at night, you get a couple other people and ask them as a favor to be your audience. You just run through the whole program as if you are performing it. Mm. And you, you do this for a few days in a row. So you actually get your body and your mind, everything ready for actual performance. Yeah. Yeah. And in between you do the mental practice, you're fixing things. You live, eat, drink, smell, all of these things with your music in mind. There's there's an incredible amount of parallels of what you've described and, and competing in, in combat competition. Hmm. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. The, so that is incredibly thorough and it and it seems like a main function of of the training is to is to once you're on the stage nothing should really feel uh, n n of course it's a, it's new because there's 3000 people watching you but there isn't many situations uh, that you've not already been through so you've made a mistake before in front of people and you've carried on and you've performed yes. it in front of people, and you've performed it when you've almost been asleep. So it seems you're just preparing from every angle. Yes, you do. You need to prepare for every angle. And still, the energy of the hall, the energy of the audience, you cannot predict. Right, right. So you have to, so you prepare what you can, and then leave the space, the mind space, still for new things, right? Because it, the energy of the audience, you cannot predict. And then your interaction with the hall, with the instrument, sometimes the instrument is not what you expect, right? So uh, uh, e even though you try it, and uh, there are still some uh, unpredictable factors in there, and sometimes the audience are very cold, sometimes the audience are very enthusiastic, you have to deal with all that. Right. Right. So you prepare. You have to also sleep very well. You need to get into a routine, just like in combat, Tai Chi. I'm sure. Yeah. Your body, your mind need to be absolutely in the ultimate state of awareness, consciousness. Yeah. You can you can pay a heavy price if you don't get your sleep and your rest. I've I've <laughs> I've, I've seen it happen many times. So yeah. so would you would you say that in 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 that musical career that you've experienced many flow states or a state of Zen or in the zone? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You have to be in the zone. Mostly, you know, when you perform at the highest level, you have to be in the zone. If you're not, you simply not performing your best. Yeah. 
So, so your did, body, your mind, your spirit, it's all in the zone. Yeah, so, you're actually prep it, being in the zone before even. You, so you're actually in that zone, in that flow state uh, all this time. So what would that feel like to you? So say uh, maybe you can pluck one of your performances out, out, of, the, out of the memory bank somewhere. Uh, you're on the stage and you're in the middle of the performance. What did that feel like? <laughs> Oh, it you feel like oh, for lack of better word, I uh, you're basically floating and you're you're both calm and excited at the same time. You are you have super awareness, you have super consciousness at that point because you can hear your awareness. It's incredible in that zone. You can hear everything. You're aware of everything. You're aware of the energy around you. You're aware of the sound, the feeling. Uh, it is an incredible feel. You are really, you're, you're just, I don't know how to describe it. You're mm -hmm. in a higher state of consciousness, awareness. Yeah. And you're like in a different space altogether. Yeah, I, 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 I've never performed at a level that you have in terms of music, but when I was on a band, when I was singing in a band, I would felt like I was charged with electricity. I would, was on another, on, on, another, yes. on another level. It really is. So it's an amazing feeling. Uh, amazing feeling. Yeah. Um, did you, have you ever recreated that flow state in any other endeavor, or was it, is it only music? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, um, I I think there was, uh, uh, to be honest, there was a glimpse of it when I uh, facilitate uh, leadership programs. Uh, it not quite uh, completed at that level, but there's a glimpse of it one when you're facilitating a group, when you're really aware of the energy of the group, there's some similarity, but I wouldn't put it in the same level. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you transitioned from high-level performance art into, into leadership, into, leadership, into training leaders and mm -hmm. uh, CEOs and all, all manner of people in the corporate world. So, is the is the crossover from a high level performer to a to a corporate facilitator is is that natural? Is it easy? Um, how, how did that How does that go? It is very natural and very easy. If you think about it, everything that we talk about in the leadership space, it it can be honed in in the classical music world. Because in the classical music, you have to be a a wonderful, excellent individual contributor first. You have to know your skill, right? So that's the that's the um, the first and foremost you have to do. Then, in order to play with other people, you have to understand how you interact with others as a, in a team, like as in chamber music, right. right? Yeah. But and then, in order to be if you are really truly a leader of an ensemble, as even in small ensemble, or if you're playing with an orchestra, and or if you're a conductor of the orchestra, you have to understand the whole group dynamic. And you have to be, at the end of it, you have to be inspiring. Hmm. All of these things actually directly correlated with with being the best leader you can be. Right. So that transition really is, it's, if you think about being, being a conscious leader, being in the top form, being the inspiring leader, have a good vision, understanding where you want to go, where do you want to lead the team or lead the organization, you have to understand both the external environment and the internal environment, and you in order to inspire others to do what 
what you like them to do to lead them, you have to have really a very, very creative mind and you need to inspire other people to be in the higher consciousness of, of leadership because in our time, our world, I think that's critical mm. because look at our environment, right? In today's world, a lot of the best organizations now, the best leaders are the leaders who are inspiring, who are um, conscious of what the environmental impact is. Yeah, A lot of the great companies now are interrupting the space and really understand how to become the best company both in terms of for the for the employees but also for the community and for the greater environment meaning for the planet so you know there's the, the companies that are doing circular economy trying to get all the uh, not uh, producing so much waste but really come back and trying to reincorporate that waste into their business cycle. There are companies who are are taking a really giant step in terms of minimizing their environmental impact. And these leaders are in the forefront. Yeah. So we're thinking of, maybe along like Elon Musk, that kind of... He is thing. definitely my, uh, you know... Uh, uh, I, I admire what he does, mm. Elon Musk, but also in traditional companies, you know, you know, for instance, Danone is uh, uh, also uh, very much in the circular economy space and they're trying to incorporate some of the plastic and try to how to get uh, within the company, how to use that. Keering is another uh, a conglomerate a fashion brand who really traces from the raw material and all the way to the consumers and that whole process how more sustainable there's a lot of companies that are doing this and of course Elon Musk is a, is a, is a major inspirational leader in terms of how to get the EV into the mass market it is major interrupter, but many of the businesses, companies that I work with, are very focused on sustainability. Ford is is very much in that space as well. Okay. We uh, we heard you talk about a, a, a few kind of leadership essentials like personal excellence. Basically, you have to be excellent at what you're doing. That's just a prerequisite. You have to yes. under, you have to understand group dynamic and. Um, and be inspirational and, and also creative. How do you find those skills can enhance or enrich just day-to-day -day life from, from your personal experience? Do you find that there's a lot of crossover into day-to-day -day quality of life, having those skills? Absolutely. I think, uh, I personally, I'm a beneficiary of studying leadership. Right. Uh, all of these leadership lessons, actually, it's personal growth lessons. Each of us can learn from these. For instance, you know, I, when I um, facilitate uh, leadership groups, uh, experienced leaders, and, um, you know, helping them to develop their vision for their teams, for their organizations, I also practice the same. I, with my husband, we talk about what is our five-year vision for us as a couple both in terms of how, what does, you know, the, what does success look like five years from now for us as a family? And uh, what kind of lifestyle do we want to live? And what kind of impact that we want to have around us? So, and, and how do we then have the strategy to realize that vision? And what are the priorities that we need to really focus on? So instead of just being reactive in our life, reactive to all the emergencies and this and that in life, then, then we don't focus on the right things to, to, to support our strategy to realize our vision, right? So the same things that you learn from leadership space, you can apply to your, to your works, to your, you know, family space, to your, 
uh, social space, how do you have the kind of conversations that would actually be more supportive of others and engaging? Uh, the same kind of things that we talk about in leadership space happens in our friendship space, right? How do you support others for growth? How do you engage with them? And if you need to have critical conversations with them to address uh, challenging situations. Yeah. All of those. Yeah. So, um, I'm, obviously, I want to be respectful of your time. So, maybe I'll just ask you one more leadership question before we jump into some rapid-fire bonus questions and then we'll round it <laughs> off. Is that okay? Okay, yes. <laughs> okay. So, uh, this, this may be a little bit of a tricky question, but obviously you've been around world-class musicians and world-class leaders in the business world. If you could just pick one common attribute, that you, obviously there, there may be many more, but if you could just pick one common attribute that, that you see and that you admire or that you, you, you can see uh, the power of, uh, what one attribute do you see across, across uh, multiple disciplines with high-level high performers? Hmm. Does that make sense? Well, one, yes, one is a hard can I have one plus? <laughs> okay, sure, of course you can. <laughs> one plus. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, they're, they're just, yeah, let me just say it's shortly, but, but a couple of really key attributes, right? One is to have a really, um, the authenticity is very important. Okay. Yeah. Authenticity, but how that authenticity is contributed to uh, a a having a clear vision. Okay. Having a clear vision is related to authenticity because authentically, what you think of that vision would be, whether if it is having the kind of vision to have a perfor particular performance, or having a authentic creative vision really for organization the authenticity comes with the core value because that's where you are the essence of a person and that also relates to the spirit that you have whether as a leader or as a performer and of course to support that you need to have absolutely the drive the drive of practicing, you know, six to eight hours a day to perfecting it or to work persistently towards your vision, it's a critical success factor for both a leader and a performer. That's what I think. So thank you for, for doing a great job uh, of a concise answer. I'm going to throw some, some bonus questions at you now, okay? So yeah, this is yeah. a little bit, little bit of fun. On a scale of one to ten, how weird are you? How weird? Yes. I would say uh, off the chart weird, oh. probably. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> off the chart weird. We like that. Okay. Uh, what, would, <laughs> what would someone who doesn't like you say about you? Oh, gosh. What would someone? That's a very good question. This is the tricky question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should probably ask more of someone who doesn't like me. Uh, I don't think I have a very good uh, data on that one. Okay. I, I think that that is a very good question because it prompts me to think about I should ask that question because that will give me a bit more insight on how I show up as a person or as a leader to people who doesn't like me. You're going to have to I, do a bit of research. Yes, I'm going to have to do a bit of research. <laughs> okay. That's a good question. Well, I'll, I'll get your answer another time then. Okay. <laughs> have, you, have you a favorite quote? My favorite quote? Hmm. Mm. My favorite quote, one is, be the change that you want to see. Mm. Yeah, because... Uh, I really think uh, we are upon the age of great change uh, in our lifetime. 
uh, from an environmental perspective, from the whole world order, as he, we have experienced the last few months, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, we often talk about corporate social responsibility. And uh, I last time I was in Thailand, actually, I heard this great talk and, and uh, the speaker talk about personal social responsibility. And I really, that made an impression. I think we need to really think about our own so personal social res responsibility. Right. So, okay, last last bonus <laughs> question. You can have three people, living or dead, come round for dinner. Who do you invite? <laughs> That's a great question. Who do I invite? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, gosh, wow. This really makes me think. Um, living or three, dead? Living or dead. Yeah, they can be from any time period. Could be the Yellow Emperor. Could be... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could be Cleopatra, Einstein. I'm just... <laughs> okay, okay. I think... Uh, I would like to invite Bach. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's as in Sebastian, Johann Sebastian Bach. Yep. Okay. So that's one person I like to invite. Uh, the s second person I like to invite is uh, probably uh, 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 Nelson Mandela. Okay. Okay. Um, and the third person I like to invite, it would be uh, uh, probably Elon Musk. Okay, that's an interesting dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> you have Bach. <laughs> You'll have Nelson Mandela and Elon Musk. Very good. Any choice of food? Vegan. Vegan, of course. <laughs> okay. <laughs> vegan meal. Vegan meal. <laughs> Sorry, Johan Basque, you're going to be eating vegan tonight. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. So, so to round up, um, the, many of the listeners to this podcast will be professional people, uh, hardworking people. Any words of advice you would offer them um, on music, language, leadership, anything, any final words you'd like to say? at all if if you'd like yeah to. yeah i do actually you know i have formed uh the uh, non-profit society called lumi voce a voice for the wild uh i would love it if anybody who listened to this to really take an interest to our environment and to our wildlife, because we've lost more than 50% of our wildlife from 1970 to 1914. We've lost more than 50% of our planet's wildlife. I would like to invite everybody to take a closer look on the situation we're facing, and really, especially leaders, Okay, and influence the people around you to take a hard look on, as humans, our 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 lifestyle, and how we each of us might be able to do something to reverse that effect. Because for our children, our children's children's sake, and also for all the other species, have you know for their sake as well, because we're here together. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a healthy planet to have, to live in, in the future. Okay. So do this and that, for everyone, all the being. And that leads on very nicely to my, my final question, which is where can people find out about you, connect with that project, or work with you, or how can people uh, connect with you, or that project? Well, our, our website is under construction. We're hoping to get it. Uh, Lumivoce.org is under construction. Uh, we're hoping to get it up by the end of uh, this year, uh, maybe sooner. Uh, however, right now, we're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Okay. So 
please check us out. And uh, we are working on several projects that should be on those websites soon. Uh, these are educational projects and artistic projects. Uh, so we will be up very, very soon. So, but do follow us if you may and leave a message. Uh, you know, join join a voice for the wild, Lumi Voce. Okay, could you, you can. could you spell that for us? Just, just uh, yeah. yeah. It's L U M I V O C E. Lumi comes from illuminate. Yeah. And Voce is a voice in Italian. So, uh, so a l l l luminate voice, a voice for the wild. Beautiful. Excellent. Excellent. So the people now know how to reach out with you and connect with you um, with that project. What remains for me to say is thank you so much, Ying Ying. This is an amazing conversation with a, a, lot, of different, um, a lot of different topics covered and uh, incredibly enlightening. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to, oh, to talk Oh, it is to a me. great pleasure, Robin. And it's wonderful to work with you and, and to talk with you. This is absolutely wonderful. Thank, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to talk to you about this. Really wonderful. Excellent. Thanks so much. Hey, guys and girls, before you go, I want to tell you about the Mindfulness for Modern Life bundle I've created for you. You can get this for free when you sign up for updates at warriorstrategy.com. Now, in this bundle, you're going to get an 8 Tai Chi Chuen Performance Enhancers PDF, a powerful Qigong video and a mindfulness audio track. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to warriorstrategy.com. Hey, this is Robin Gamble, thanking you for listening, hoping you enjoyed the content and kindly asking you to share with your friends if you did. Thanks again and see you next time.